Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the August 17th, 2016 Dr. Cog board meeting. Great to have everyone here. You might have noticed, like I noticed, that we don't have a very lengthy agenda today. So we could all work together and be out of here in time to watch the Olympics by, say, 8. Just saying. So um, let's rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. So, Connie, if you could do the roll call. Thank you. Eva Henry. Here. Bill Holen. Here. Elise Jones. Here. David Beacom. Here. Tim Mock. Here. <laughs> <laughs> sort of. Chrissy Fanganello. No. Chrissy Fanganello. Chrissy Fanganello. Robin Kanich. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Gail Watson. Don Rozier, Libby Zabo, Bob Pfeiffer. Here. Bob Roth. Here. Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett. Here. Ann Justin, Lynn Baca, Rex Bell, George Teal, Paul Donahue, Doris Trular. Here. Ron Engels, Catherine Heider, Laura Chrisman. Here. Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter. Here. Debbie Nasta, Carl Randolph. Steve Conklin, Here. Joe Jefferson, Steve Yates, Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Scott Norquist, Here. Saoirse Karras Graves, Casey Brown, Ron Rakowski, Here. Mike Hillman, Brad Weasley, Stephanie Walton, Shakti, Here. Jerry Bean, Phil Sunanik. Present. Jackie Malay, Here. John Peck, Gabe Santos, Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Here. Colleen Whitlow, Here. Deborah Jerome, Sean Foray, Chris Larson, Kyle Mullica, Here. John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Gary Howard, Rita Dozal, Here. Adam Matkowski, Eric Montoya, Herb Atchison, Here. Joyce J. Gary Sanford, Deborah Perkins Smith, Bill Van Meter. We have a quorum. Great. And we have introduced, so unless there are any proposed changes, I would entertain a motion to approve the agenda. We have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The agenda is approved. The main focus of the evening is the public hearing on redetermination of air quality conformity. And I have a script I'm supposed to read. And I'm good at following directions. So here goes. Um, I'm Elise Jones, Chair of Denver Regional Council of Governments. Thank you all for coming tonight. This evening, Dr. Cog is holding a public hearing on the proposed conformity redetermination of the 2015 Cycle 2 2040 Fiscally Constrained Regional Transportation Plan and the Companion Air Quality Conformity Redetermination Documents. The public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the proposed conformity redetermination of the 2015 Cycle 2 2040 Fiscally Constrained Regional Transportation Plan. Seriously? Yes. Whew. To make comments to the board, no decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to this public hearing. Re receiving public comment is important to our decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak should register on the sign-in sheets on the table in the reception area or should have previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments via email, website, or in writing are automatically included in the public hearing record. Any comments received prior to this meeting have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those testifying. Steve Cook of Dr. Cog's staff will now summarize the proposed conformity redetermination. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Dr. Cog's key transportation role is to prepare and adopt a long-range regional transportation plan and a short-range transportation improvement program, or TIP as it's known. Both of these documents, as originally adopted and are frequently amended, must be found to conform to national air quality standards and associated state implementation plans for air quality, also known as SIPs. There are three criteria pollutants to which the SIPs apply, carbon monoxide, particulate matter, and ozone, which is the pollutant of greatest concern to our region example today. Um, the Dr. Cog Board last approved the conformity determinations for the regional transportation and the TIP in March earlier this year. Uh, a, posi a positive conformity determination is made if the model predicted future amount of transportation emissions are less than established budget limits. And these are region-wide uh, budget totals in tons of pollutants per day. After the approvals in March, staff discovered coding errors to a couple of segments in the roadway network that's used in the Dr. Cog travel model. The travel model depicts existing roadway network and transit system and the transit system and is adjusted to reflect future transportation plan projects. The network is made up, made up of over 20,000 segments. It's combined with future population and employment estimates to forecast traffic volumes, transit ridership, travel times, and many other measures. Um, staff consulted with uh, Dr. Cog's Air Quality Interagency Consultation Group, or the, our ICG, and decided to conduct a redetermination of regional conformity for the same exact long-range regional transportation plan uh, and TIP that approved earlier this year. The, this entailed rerunning the travel model with the corrected segment data and also used an updated version of EPA or the Environmental Protection Agency's pollutant emission model. The new emission results that we found were insignificantly different from the previous results that were approved in March. And all of the results fell well under uh, each of the individual pollutant budget uh, limits. Therefore, conformity is demonstrated for Dr. Cog's long-range regional transportation plan and TIP. The redetermination documents are linked within your agenda packet and have been available to the public for the past month. So the hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. We actually didn't have anyone sign up to speak. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak to us on this? Okay, seeing no one, then that brings the public hearing to a close. Thanks for everyone's interest. We are scheduled to take action on the proposed conformity redetermination of the 2015 Cycle 2 2040 fiscally constrained RTP in September. So that brings us to the report of the chair. And I mainly wanted to say thank you to everybody who could make the board retreat. And um, for those of you who weren't able to get there, um, many of us who've been to board retreats thought it was the best one we'd been to yet. Kudos to the staff for organizing some really amazing presentations. And I did want to ask whether or not those presentations are on the website or could be put on the website for those um, folks who couldn't attend. They are on the website, they are on the website now. Um, there was uh, one on millennials, boomers, and sort of the future of communities with some really interesting um, thought-provoking data. And then there was another one on what's next for mobility. And we also had a very robust and I think helpful conversation about urban growth boundary and area, um, the, that issue and how we wanted to deal with it as a board going forward. So um, it was good relationship building as well. And uh, I just want to thank everybody who could make the time to make it up to Breckenridge. It was a really good one. And I think that's all I have except for a report on the uh, RTC. Yesterday, um, RTC approved participating in the B Mobility Choice Blueprint Initiative and to recommend taking $500,000 from the TIP in order to fund participation. 
um, also approved the project selection recommendations for the 2016-17 funding for tra traffic signal system improvement program and regional intelligent transportation system deployment equipment. And we also re um, got briefings on the transportation planning in Denver region perspectives and the uh, draft active transportation component of the MetroVision RTP. So that's it from me. Um, I will turn it over to Jennifer for her report. Thank you. I'll keep it short and sweet. First, I'll bring your attention to the handouts at uh, your seat this evening. Uh, the one in four idea exchange. Uh, this is about uh, how communities are responding to the aging crisis here in the region. Uh, great opportunity to hear what other communities are doing to design age-friendly um, uh, communities and neighborhoods. That'll be on Tuesday, August 30th here at Dr. Cog from 9.30 to noon. The other uh, white and blue sheet uh, at your desk this evening is uh, about registration for the uh, Small Communities Hot Topics Forum. Um, this is, uh, anyone can attend, but this is certainly targeting the smaller communities, uh, talk about things that are going on there, challenges that they're having, bringing in some expert speakers. We've already surveyed communities to find out what they think is important, what they want to learn more about. Um, I think infrastructure was actually the number one thing that we heard about. Uh, that will be here at Dr. Cog from 8.30 to 4.30 on September 15th. Certainly uh, hope that uh, all of our smaller communities uh, will either uh, send staff or come yourself. Uh, another announcement uh, on August 23rd from 1 to 4, also here at Dr. Cog, that's not a handout, I'm sorry. Um, there's a bike uh, and pedestrian stakeholder meeting. Uh, at that meeting, uh, attendees will be hearing about complete streets, uh, emerging practices, innovative design, uh, get to see some uh, both national as well as local design examples. And then back to the handouts at your seat, um, call your attention to the navy uh, and white uh, handout with the photographs of those three lovely people there at the bottom. Um, it's Dr. John Torres, who is the uh, Nine News um, uh, health uh, consultant and uh, Murphy Houston who's been in broadcasting here in the Denver metro region for about 40 years and um, Jayla Sanchez Warren our AAA director uh, this is a flyer for no copay radio this is the show that Dr. Cog is hosting uh, this um, program is aired every Saturday uh, we've actually had some board members uh, come and talk about some different things uh, for example Phil uh, Sir Nanik has been uh, on the show to talk about um, financial planning for the future. Uh, we just it, had. It uh, uh, does help when you have a face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> um, we also had a uh, former Dr. Cog uh, board member, uh, still mayor of Centennial, Kathy Noon, come. She did a couple of segments. Uh, she talked about how their uh, communities. Senior Advisory Committee is informing or will be informing their comp planning process, which is coming up. She also talked about a pilot program that they're going to be doing in Centennial, helping seniors um, uh, get to uh, uh, various senior centers and other places. So um, very excited about this. We actually have the highest uh, ratings of any Saturday show now. Uh, so, or on the station anyway, so we're really proud of that. And we're extremely excited too because um, John Torres just um, got a contract with um, the NBC family. So it'd be NBC, CNBC, uh, all of those um, um, stations to be their health reporter. So uh, he's very committed to continue to do no copay radio, but he has talked about uh, and he's talked with NBC about uh, taking some of these kind of localized issues uh, to a more national uh, audience. So we're really excited. And I've already told him uh, we're going to come to him and ask him to talk about uh, Older Americans Act when it's time to do the next uh, authorization. Um, the other thing I want to point out at your desk, this purple and white sheet, uh, this was a document that was prepared and handed out uh, to attendees at the workshop, and it talks about all the accomplishments um, 
not all the accomplishments, some highlights of the accomplishments of, um, of, the, of the organization, the board and staff uh, during 2015. So give that a look. This is great information uh, for you to take back and share with um, your councils and commissions as well. And just a couple more things to wrap it up. Um, related to the workshop, um, uh, the Performance and Engagement Committee will be uh, kind of debriefing the, uh, the workshop and activities and how things went and what we might do better or differently uh, going forward. But I did want to say that Jerry Stiegel, our director of, um, um, it'll come to me. <laughs> Organizational development, thank you. <laughs> Uh, well, senior uh, moment there, I guess. Um, I did survey attendees. Um, about 90%, I think, um, responded back, and 96% of respondents rated the uh, workshop as excellent or good. Uh, so, as Elise said, it was it was a very successful workshop. We're really proud of of how that went, um, and I think. That's everything. I will say that, um, as we discussed at the last meeting, uh, my more detailed uh, report to the board will now just go to uh, performance and engagement. So you can always look at those agendas if you want to know more. I'm always happy to talk to you about those things. But um, that's why your agenda package is so small tonight. So thank you. I did hear one piece of feedback that's probably worth sharing, and that's that Director Atchison wanted to do more team building exercises <laughs> involving strength. I heard that too. Uh, yeah, but there's a caveat to that. How much Crown Royal can you afford, Lee? There we go. It did cost me a little bit. Yeah. Okay, with that, um, we will um, have public comment. I don't know if there's going to be any more people that want to comment to us than did earlier, but if anyone in the audience would like to come speak to us, on a topic that is not before us or has not been before us, please let us know. I'm not seeing any takers. Going once, going twice. Gone. We will close public comment and move on to the consent agenda, but we need to pull the minutes from the consent agenda because there are two corrections we know of. We apologize for misspelling Director Kelsey's name. And uh, the, there's a, the wrong meeting date for the next meeting. Are there any other um, corrections to the minutes? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the amended minutes. Moved and seconded. All in favor? Opposed? Abstention? The minutes are approved. So then moving on to the action agenda, um, we're going to discuss the mobility choice blueprint. We, we did discuss it in concept last meeting and indicated it was something we wanted the staff to bring back to us. and. By gosh, they are. Here we are. Thank you and good evening. And yeah, as, um, as the chair mentioned, I, I, to be respectful of your time, I certainly won't rehash everything that we talked about last, last month. Before you say good, I do, do want to just clarify a couple things that um, I've had some questions about that I'm sure will be of interest to everybody just to make sure we're all on the same page. The first, with regards to this, there are really two elements to this mobility choice in this initiative. There's the mobility choice nonprofit which is uh, a, a creation of, of, uh, of uh, the Denver Metro Chamber. And then there's the Blueprint Initiative. The Blueprint Initiative itself is, is the study that, um, that, that Dr. Cog, RTD, and CDOT are, co are cooperating and, and are going to fund. Um, that is where our $500,000 investment is going to, towards the study, not to the operations of the nonprofit. I just, Want to make sure everybody was clear on that. And I, I also just want to give you a quick update on where we are with all this. Um, you know, just to just to refresh your memory a little bit with regards to what the you know the, the uh, what the intent of this this pro project is. There's really there's a several elements to this. First, um, part of the scope will be t uh, to include an assessment of our mobility needs, both current and future needs, and with the whole concept that um, that you know we will then hopefully be able to look and see if we can harness technology going forth to fulfill those mobility gaps. Technology is not always going to be the answer, we know that, but we, we, we're looking for opportunities that we can, um, you know, improve our transportation system as much as we can. So we're, so those, that, those are really the two big elements, um, you know, of the study itself. 
we do, you know, we will also be working on, which I think is kind of neat, kind of a 15, um, kind of 15 year out scenario of what our, uh, of likely technologies and how we might use those to, to incorporate into our transportation planning process to provide the mobility that we desire. Um, so that was, that's kind of a neat feature itself. But, you know, from our perspective, from Dr. Cog's perspective, besides, you know, getting a better understanding of the technologies that are coming forth that we will incorporate into our transportation planning process, there is, you know, there's a selfishness to this that I feel that just learning more about the, um, the uh, current uh, mobility needs and future mobility needs will help Dr. Cog in our long-range planning process. Um, particularly, you know, as we're just finishing up a long-range transportation plan, we begin another. So this is an opportunity for us to learn as much as we can so we can prepare and uh, provide back to you all our recommendations on, uh, on, um, on projects and programs as we go forth. Um, we did meet with uh, the Mobility Choice nonprofit yesterday. Uh, we do, if, if you recall, we do have representation on that board. Um, ourselves, Dr. Dr. Cog, RTD, and CDOT each have seats on that, on that, uh, on that board, as well as um, former Douglas County Commissioner uh, Jack Hilbert and former Boulder County Commissioner, Mayor, Board Chair, whatever, everything else, Will Tor, um, is also on that committee. So we, 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 we do have representation, and we brought, you know, we wanted to talk to them about, um, you know, where we have this large public investment that we're making to, to fund this study, we want to make sure that um, you know we're providing and we have the proper oversight to make sure that we're we are um, using that those public dollars in the best best fashion available in the interest of the public. So um, I just just wanted to to give you a quick update on where we are with that too. So we're working with with the board um, to make sure that we feel comfortable ultimately with the, with the level of oversight and, and input um, in the process. With that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Director Roth. Not a question, but there's been some uh, concern expressed about the $500,000 allocation of funds without some better framework around exactly what this organization is going to look like. Correct. And so rather than the proposed action, I would like to uh, move a different action. I'd like to move approval to participate and contribute funding towards the Mobility Choice Blueprint contingent upon structure and governance of the organization that is mutually agreeable, or excuse me, mutually acceptable to CDOT, RTD, Dr. Cog, and the Chamber. Um, I, I think Jackie seconded. Bob, did you say governance of the organization and scope of the study? I said structure and governance of the organization that is mutually acceptable. Could we? Could I make a friendly amendment that you add and scope of the study? I'm fine with that. Is that? Mm -hmm. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, discussion. Uh, Director Pfeiffer. I appreciate the the motion. This microphone doesn't move, but um, <laughs> John glued it. Um, <laughs> but but I think it's uh, here. I'll grab one more. Um, no, I, I just want to make sure we put this in context for our fellow board members. I, I have some reservations and I asked some clarity around the framework and the governance of this newly formed organization. We're giving a half million dollars of public money uh, and yet we don't know what the governance and framework will look like. So I just want to make sure that it is in context that I was the one that kind of raising the hand a little concerned and a little nervous without seeing what that looks like, that we put a contingency in, and I appreciate uh, Commissioner Roth uh, making the motion, so. Further discussion? Director Mullica, and then Director Partridge. I just had a question, and that was even before uh, Director Roth's motion. Um, what, what was the plan, or what is the plan for Dr. Cog's role in this, and, and staff, and how often is this board going to be updated on the process? for this so oh, good, good questions yes with regards to you know what our role is what staff's role is we've been we've been intricately involved in this right from the outset Don Hunt former director of CDOT he came in 
and um, uh, presented to the board back in December of 2015 about this concept. And I think Don would even tell you at the time, it was really no more than a concept, right? It was an opportunity for public, public agencies as well as the private sector to come together and collaborate on, on you know, technology improvements, improving our transportation mobility going forth. And other than that, there was really wasn't much more. But after it seemed to resonate with the board, um, Dr. Cog's staff, as well as CDOT and RTD staff, we met with the chamber and Don Hunt to begin to kind of flush out the details of this, right, to something that we felt comfortable that we could, you know, ultimately fund. And, and um, you know, we're still working on that in a lot of respects. I mean, we haven't totally scoped this whole thing out. We have concepts, and, you know, the final scope won't be ultimately developed until, you know, a consultant would be selected and what have you, of course. But, um, but so, so we, we will be intricately involved in the uh, development of the scope. That I can promise you. Um, and, you know, we made that quite clear. And I, quite frankly, I think that is, that is the intended purpose of us, us being involved on the, on the board as well as there's, a, there's a, like a staff committee. Um, and actually, we're, we're meeting next week, uh, Jennifer, to um, we're meeting with uh, staff of RTD, CDOT, and the chamber um, to really begin to hash out the RFQ requirements and the scope and some of the structural governance stuff that, um, that um, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pfeiffer and others have mentioned. Um, so, so yes, yeah, so we'll, we're, we're, very, we're very aware that this is public money. This is, this is you know, collectively our money. We might want to make sure that we, we provide the, um, the best product, that, the product that we're going to be happy with. With regards to um, how often the board, the Dr. Cobb board will be updated, um, I'll really actually throw that back to you all to, to see how involved you want to be. We know within the scope when it's, when it's ultimately developed that part of that will be uh, regular updates from the consultant to the Dr. Cog board. Um, you know, I don't know how often you might want that. You want it bi-monthly, uh, quarterly, whatever that might be, but we'll make sure we can ac we'll accommodate that. Do folks have comments on that particular question about frequency of updates? Director Pfeiffer, and then I know Director Parker. I just want to correct. I, I called Commissioner Roth. He's Director Roth, whatever he is. I just don't want to promote him by, by myself. Here. Oh, does it? Well, look at our chair. Yeah, if you want to get I, paid, I guess it chair. is. Uh, no, I would say quarterly would probably be plain for right now. Is just my recommendation. I think that uh, you know we want to see the progress, and right. we're excited to, to participate. But right. I think framework and governance are critical. Director Malay. And then <laughs> just to follow up on that, I think there are going to be some key milestones with the project. So as opposed to saying quarterly, I would like to see when the scope of work is developed. Just to know that, I'd like to see when the consultant is hired. And then I would assume a schedule is going to be developed. I mean, I would say milestones are yeah, probably actually, more what I would want to see versus a set time. Perhaps we could do key milestones or, or quarterly, or at least quarterly, if that works with folks. Director Partridge, you're, you've been in the queue and patient, sorry. First comment, I, I had a conversation with Doug because I had a question regarding accountability and, and make sure there was some degree of oversight. And after that conversation with Doug and knowing he met with the group, uh, I feel comfortable with that. So thank you, Doug, just wanted to make that comment. Again, that oversight through Dr. Cog is there, appreciate that. Uh, had a question, could we read the motion again? I had a question on the, the motion. Move to approve, uh, move approval to participate and contribute funding towards the mobility choice blueprint contingent upon structure govern and governance of the organization plus Director Jones's scope of the study uh, that is mutually acceptable to CDOT, RTD, Dr. Cog, and the Chamber. Okay, so kind of a question, Director Roth, as I as I hear that, it kind of sounds like in the motion it creates another action would be necessary that we would have to assure that there's a mutually agreed upon, uh, a mutual agreement between all entities there. So I kind of see that the motion creates another action necessary. Is that, was that the intention? I think the original intention was uh, just to protect Dr. Cog's half million dollar investment. Uh, <clears throat> but since we were addressing that we want it to be 
uh, we want the opportunity to comment on what that structure and governance is, we felt like it was nece it was necessary to include the other three entities as well to, to have them. So that's why the mutually acceptable, but I understand your, your point as well. Okay, so is the, does the, the implication occur that if one of the other entities does not mutually agree with it, then in a way our support is null. Otherwise, if all entities are agreeing with it, we're in agreement with it. Is that the intent of the motion? Okay, we have a couple of different people that seem to want to comment on this. Doctor and Director Malay, Wait, was, uh, like, and no. then I'll take that promotion. Director uh, Rakowski, and then Jennifer. Madam Chair, that was actually a question. I, I was going to say I'll defer to Jennifer if you want to. I mean, yeah. I think the 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 yeah. expect the the I think the intent was that um, it, this is only going to work if all three parties are involved in it, and that um, the the executive director would be empowered to act by this action assuming that all three of those were uh, in agreement that it wasn't going to come back to us necessarily for action but that the executive director was empowered to act assuming that that staff was in agreement with the scope of work and the other parties were involved did you have more to add to that director Rakowski yes am I am I correct in assuming that our representative will be the executive director yep thank you and Jennifer, did you want to add anything? I think we're all responding to Roger's question. Yeah, I, I think uh, Jackie explained it. The, the concern amongst the three public funders was that we would be able to, uh, I, I don't think that we have a concern about the three of us agreeing. We want to be sure that, um, uh, though, that the rest of the mobility cho choice organization is in agreement with how we think the um, the scope should be written, um, any major scope changes, what the governance looks like, understanding how the public sector entities fit into this bigger uh, overall uh, picture. Okay. And so my understanding would be that if either RTD or CDOT would not approve the half million input, that then our if we do approve the motion, then our motion would be null and void also. Correct. Direct. Jennifer? <laughs> well, I guess what I'll say first is, is that uh, uh, Mr. Hunt has always said that this is an all or nothing thing, that all three public sector entities need to be participating in this in order for them to go forward. So uh, again, I, if I understood what Director Roth was saying, um, you were approving the expenditure of the $500,000 if CDOT, Dr. Cog, and RTD all agreed with the structure and governance and the scope um, development and any major changes throughout the project to the scope if we were all in if we were all in concert with what the what the private sector was was trying to accomplish then we would all go forward uh, C, or excuse me CDOT I think is already correct they've already um, approved the funding RTD has not this goes to the RTD board next month yeah. director Atchison kind of follow up with director Partridge yes we're doing this partly to protect us because if there's something goes sideways in this way, we will have in the contract, if, as we were discussing, we have a back out. So if this thing doesn't go forward and we can't agree to the scope, then our $500,000 is protected. And I think that's what you were alluding to. Are we at risk if somebody else pulls out? No, because it has to be a three-party agreement. The other thing we have to make sure we understand is that the $500,000 that we are committing if this passes is strictly for the purpose of doing the study. This has nothing to do with the staffing of this organization. That is all done through the chamber. They're paying for that separate. They are not putting money into the study. That's where the million and a half comes from. But we have to, as a, an entity, make sure that we're protected. If this thing starts to go awry, that we can call a halt to it. And that's part of what we were talking with Jennifer about is we have to have language in this IGA that we're going to do with them that protects us as an entity that if something happens, we have a way to come back. 
And I, if I might add, I, I think the practical reality is that all three public sector parties are interested in participating. This just sends a signal to the chamber, don't forget that we care about the governance of this and let's get that right right up front. So I think it's, it's, it's more than anything sending that signal to the chamber about that. Further discussion? Director Dozel. The, it says here, though, that the Mo Mo Mobility Choice Organization, which I heard was the nonprofit, Correct. is a partnership among the chamber and the three of us. Correct. Well, so, but we're also saying that we're not participating in, the, in funding of the nonprofit, but it says we're a partner in the nonprofit. So well, I, I'm just kind of we, uh, thinking there's a little bit of Right. cross over there. Well, I'm we not have sure what we are doing versus the nonprofit. Right, right. Yeah, partnership. Um, you know, we, we have we have seats on the board, um, and that was actually a request made by us uh, way back that uh, each of the three public agencies should also have a seat on their board. Um, so, so, so that's the level of our involvement with the with the nonprofit. I think the key is we're not funding staffing of the nonprofit. Go ahead. I just would like us to be a little bit more definitive here, probably, of what we are going to do, rather than this as we're a partner with the chamber in creating this nonprofit. But yet we just were told that our $500,000 has nothing to do with the nonprofit other than creating the study. So, you know, I just think we should define this a little bit more precisely, if that's the case. No, no. And, and what will the nonprofit organization do? Well, you raise all very good points, and that was part of our discussion at the board meeting yesterday, to make, to, quite frankly, to define roles and responsibilities of the various groups a lot better than what was, what was proposed. And uh, we'll, be working, we'll be working with, with them to do that. I mean, over the next month, we should, we should be in pretty good shape, I hope. Director Malay. It's my understanding that the document included in here is more of an informational document for, for parties beyond the board of directors. This is information for general citizens and um, interested parties to know what we're doing. This is not the language that's going to be in uh, the IGA that governs our contribution. Words matter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Uh, Which is... I Any additional questions or comments? I think I had Director Mullica and then Director Pfeiffer. So this may be a little early in the process for this question, but being that public funds are being used, I think it's important. What is uh, being contemplated for community engagement during this whole process? Well, um, as far as, you know, a, a percent of the budget or something like that, I don't know if I could tell you, but there is going to be a large public involvement effort associated with this. Particularly in, on the front side, um, you know, establishing what our, in, in the assessment of our needs for present and future, there will be a large public outreach component there, as well as throughout the, in, the entire process. Um, even in, you know, some of the, the draft RFQs that we begin to put together, um, public involvement is filtered all through. And not just for the general public, but there are also going to be a, a number of various committees established, one of which is, oh, Lord, I can't remember the name. Um, but, but, but a committee that would involve, um, you know, um, uh, stakeholders or, um, interested, or interested staff from local governments, those types of things. So they will be included and involved in, in, the, in the discussion. And, and that will be regionally represented? Yes, it will be. Thank you. Director Pfeiffer. So, so I'll, I'll support the motion. I just have a clarifying question to the motion. Uh, hearing the conversation, uh, the word chamber in that motion, does that need to be in there since it's really focused around the three public entities? I know I kind of asked that the chamber, it's, there's four partners in it, but. Actually, I would have the same reaction that hearing the conversation, that probably should not be. That's what I'm thinking as well, so I would probably scratch that. that. So just the three public entities. So are you offering a friendly amendment to the uh, friendly I'm, Yeah, amendment? I'm asking a friendly amendment. <laughs> And is that accepted by the maker of the motion and the seconder? It is. It, and I just want to give rationale why I'm supporting the motion is I feel that the, um, because the organization's so new and there are all of these questions, 
half a million dollars is a lot of money to blindly hand to an organization without knowing what, how it's going to be governed and how it's going to be operating. So, uh, you know, I'm going to support the motion. I think it's a wise move on our part in being stewards of the money, and uh, I'll support the motion. All right. Are we ready to vote? Are there any final comments, questions? All right. We have a motion on the table that's been amended in a friendly fashion twice. Everyone clear on the motion? All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Thank you for that good discussion. We will now move on to recommendations to allocate 2016 and 2017 funding for contingency and multimodal signal operation support identified in the Traffic Signal System Improvement Program and the Regional Intelligent Transportation System Deployment Program. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that sounds so impressive. Yeah, well, we usually speak in acronyms, so it's a lot shorter. So. <laughs> Uh, good evening. I'm Greg McKinnon, Transportation Operations Program Manager. Uh, this, I'm going to be briefly summarizing Attachment D in your packet. And as was mentioned, it's, uh, and I'll say it in a shorter fashion, we're seeking approval for uh, recommendations for miscellaneous equipment funding. Uh, this board approved the project selection process in April. Uh, and that, uh, Dr. Cog's staff issued a call for applications for miscellaneous equipment funding. And what miscellaneous equipment funding is for is for the procurement of the equipment itself. There is no design, no construction, or no operations uh, eligible uh, as part of this uh, funding element. And the, the, uh, the, the funding was associated with three different areas, the traffic signal systems, uh, intelligent transportation systems, and multimodal signal operations support. The, uh, the, we received 10 applications, uh, eight were in the uh, traffic signal system uh, area, and that was uh, primarily uh, local jurisdictions, so your staff, we submitted those applications, and then we received two applications for intelligent transportation systems, uh, that was CDOT uh, looking for travel time monitoring on some arterial roadways. And we received no applications for the multimodal signal operations support. And then just to close things off, the recommendations are listed in the attachment. And that is my brief summary. Director Atchison. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move to uh, approve the proposed miscellaneous equipment projects for fiscal year 2016 and 2017 federal funds identified in the traffic signal system improvement program and the Regional Intelligent Transportation System Employment Program. We have an, a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. And now moving on to informational briefings, we are going to get an update on the Boomer Bond from Brad. Don't worry. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good evening, everyone. Uh, brief presentation, which I think is attachment E uh, in your packet. Um, I know we're making really good progress, so you're probably going to want to get out of here. I will try to go fast, but not too fast. Don't blow it. Yeah. Um, so this has been a program uh, that's been around for a while, and the thing I probably should have realized is I should put this slide in here, particularly for maybe new folks, um, about the term boomer bond. And I don't know if she even knows this, but... As far as I know, this came from Jennifer at one point uh, in time, and uh, people often ask me, so there's going to be money associated with this? We're going to, like, publicly finance at low interest rates uh, programs and services to support uh, older adults remaining in their homes and their communities, and unfortunately, at this point, the answer to that is no. Uh, this is more like a bond, like a hug, like individually and collectively as a region we're in this together to really sort of think about how we become potentially the best place to age um, in, the, in the entire country. So I wanted to get that out of the way first just to make sure you guys sort of are on uh, message in terms of really what this program um, is about. Um, I've got a few kind of demographic slides that really are kind of our motivations or one of our motivations as to why this, this program uh, exists. You have heard it sort of over and over and over again, I'm sure. Um, about sort of the growth in the older adult population. Jennifer even mentioned the sort of one in four uh, tagline um, that we use a lot, and that really is about by the year 
2030, 2040, uh, one in four people in our region will be over the age of 60, something that is actually very new for this reason, region. So I use this slide all the time to kind of show what that uh, growth looks like. Um, and the, I think a key message for you guys to kind of take in is that everybody wants to focus on the right-hand side of the slide, which is the growth, which is important. But I actually feel like the message is on the left-hand side, that we've never as a region experienced this before which means we don't have the solutions in, in a file somewhere. We can't go back to say, well, what did we do in 1995 the last time we dealt with this? Never, ever experienced this in our region. So this means we are going to have to think really innovatively um, about how we actually uh, address both the opportunities and the challenges uh, associated uh, with a growing older adult population. So this is percentage of the region over the age of 60. But the thing that I think is actually really interesting in the slide has bumped up uh, the, the, the title, but this is a percentage of uh, population or, or growth in the population over the age 75 um, by county between uh, 2014 and 2024. Uh, so you can see every county in our region is experiencing incredible growth um, in this population and over 75 is a really critical demographic because just through anecdotally, but as well as sort of information that we hear from other parts of the country, that's typically when people require some level of support or care to remain in their home and their community. That could be from family, that could be from a faith-based institution, that could be from a nonprofit, that could be from uh, Medicare, Medicaid. Something is going to be required for that person to remain in their home and their community. So as a region, a 60% increase um, in that population um, over uh, that 10-year period. And I can guarantee you if Jayla was here, she would say we are not going to see a 60% increase in uh, revenue available to us to provide services. So we've got to be really, again, innovative in thinking about how we are going to approach this. Um, another thing that is interesting to note about that, those growth um, uh, dynamics is that the reality is we as a region are going to have to step up to deal with this. Um, this is not a situation where we are going to export retirees to other parts of the country. We all understand how, how great this place is to live. So when we ask people over the age of 60, do you plan to remain in your community, not state of Colorado, not Denver region, where you live today, are you, do you plan to stay there throughout retirement? Typically when we ask that question, 82 to 90% of the time, people say, yes, I'm going to stay in my community that I am in right now today. And even more, maybe more importantly than that, which maybe sort of uh, says why, is that bottom uh, bullet that really, when we survey those people over the age of 60, over half have already been in their community more than 20 years. They're, they're rooted, they're vested, and they want to stay there, right? So as, as that growth happens, we are going to have to figure out what those homegrown uh, solutions uh, look like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's so, <a> feel. <laughs> So we've got to start focusing on sort of uh, on the entire community and how communities ultimately respond and embrace, um, again, the challenges and opportunities of a growing aging population. And so that really is what this program is about. It really is the central question is, are we ready? I mean, that, that is really what we're trying to help communities um, understand. And we really do this through two primary com components. Um, we create an assessment tool that communities can use locally to have the self-directed assessment about current programs, resources, services, um, and needs. Um, and then we've also um, created uh, an online inventory of best practices um, in terms of policies, tools, strategies that, that folks can use as they've identified deficits, if you want to use that term, what are some things that have been proven out in the field to work um, that they could pick up and adopt, whether that's a policy, a program, a resource, a tool, um, all those sorts of things. Uh, so the resource directory is an online thing. Um, I will not spend a lot of time on it. It's, it's, it's in your packet if you want to check it out. Um, this is actually something that came up at the workshop. Um, the chair mentioned I did a presentation about boomers and millennials, and one of the things that was talked about are what are the things that we can do today to particularly help um, with the older adult population? So, for instance, the issue that was talked about at the workshop was home sharing. Like, what, what can we do to allow unrelated older adults uh, to find a common place to live to ultimately save money to, to be able to afford um, housing in this region? Those types of programs are the types of things that we try to capture um, in the online uh, resource directory. Uh, so why an assessment tool? Why did we ultimately sort of land on the issue of older adults and the growth in that population and what can we do about it? Why do we land on an assessment tool, sort of the natural um, resource for that? Um, really what we realized in early conversations is that at the local level, it was such an overwhelming conversation, people simply didn't know where to start. Um, in one of my very first um, conversations with a community about this, that was something that the mayor of that small community just zeroed in on is, 
we're a town of 1,800 people. I don't know how we would start and finish a conversation about this very global and big um, issue. And so that's really what the assessment tool is about. Um, and the other thing that we hope that it does at the local level is creates a really targeted conversation with the public. Um, I'll, I'll mention this later, but really the assessment is very um, sort of staff and local operations driven, but we really want that to ultimately then roll out to a conversation with the public about what um, they see as, as needs and areas um, for improvement. Um, so kind of where uh, it came from, uh, about three and a half, four years ago, uh, we commissioned a series of stakeholder meetings. About 60 stakeholders volunteered six months. I would say each group probably met at least six or seven times. Um, elected officials, many of whom were board members at the time, architects, planners, human service professionals, citizens kind of got together and sort of had a conversation of what questions should local governments and communities be asking themselves to answer that, are we ready, are we prepared? And so that really um, is where this um, comes from. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, those groups had to early in the conversation make a determination who is the audience for this tool and they, they really intentionally geared it towards local government staff and operations um, for one very real reason and that is on this issue it just feels like the public sector needs to lead the private sector has a very real role but the public sector needs to sort of walk the talk on this right if they really expect the private sector to deliver products and services that meet the needs of their residents um, they need to be thinking um, in the same way um, and one of the things that we did very early on, which I think was a good thing, is we, we created a tool in a room like this over six months, and then we realized we've got to test this and see if it actually works. Uh, so I approached three communities, um, many, some of whom are around the table, and said, would you be willing to sort of test this beta version of the tool? And all three um, said yes, and that ultimately informed uh, the final version of the tool that communities are using uh, today. Uh, the tool, the sort of assessment focuses in four uh, critical topic areas that, that over time have been linked to healthy and successful aging. Uh, mobility and access, transportation is critical. People want to be, I mean, transportation is ultimately when old, with older adults about not losing your independence, which is oftentimes the biggest fear of aging. You need to be able to connect and engage um, in your community. Housing, you obviously have a, need to have a place to live. Community living, the idea of being active and engaged in your community and the, and the resources that have to be available at the community level to allow that to happen, and then support services. As I mentioned before, the vast majority of people want to remain in their home and their community. For that to happen, oftentimes some level of support um, is going to be required um, for that to happen. Uh, so as of today, uh, we have 11 communities in the region that have uh, used the assessment tool or, or have committed to do so. I probably have another at least two or three that I feel like they're headed in this direction, but I don't have necessarily that firm commitment. We haven't, haven't started, but again, um, a lot of progress um, to date and obviously hopefully um, even more to come uh, in the future. And I will say, uh, for instance, you know, this map only shows communities that have specifically used our assessment tool. So for instance, Jefferson County doesn't necessarily show up, but their Aging Well project is a very similar um, uh, resource and, and program. So this is specifically folks that have used the resource tool that was uh, identified and uh, developed by Dr. Cog. Uh, so sort of the, the uh, community commitment, just to kind of give you an idea of how much time and effort is involved at the local level. Uh, the typical organizational commitment is about four to eight months to complete uh, the assessment. Um, I will tell you that when I was meeting with Denver staff and stakeholders about this, I said double it. Uh, when you have 11,000 employees, um, and this is really kind of a local government operations thing, you can imagine that's going to take a little bit more time to set up a process that, that can be um, effective and ultimately has long-term um, outcomes and, and benefits. Um, I have, um, typically there is a single staff person um, that I work with um, as they're completing the assessment. Uh, that staff person has come from any number of departments. I've had planners. I've had people that are more human service oriented. Um, I have people in the city manager's office. Doesn't really matter. Uh, the skill sets that are sort of listed in the bullets are really the ones that are most important. Uh, really, they've got to be able to commit time and energy. I think the most that I've seen in terms of time commitment from a single person, it's been about sort of 60% FTE over the course of the assessment. Most folks can do it in kind of maybe the 20 to 50% um, to, uh, of that staff person's time. It really is about being a cat herder and an effective pest. You're asking every division and department and your, and your local government operation to think about how um, they can better respond to the aging population. And so that just simply is, is can, you can imagine, can be um, a pretty heavy lift. And we certainly, I ask 
uh, those people to, to most importantly be willing to learn about things that are outside your purview, right? So if you're the human services person, you need to be willing to sit down with a traffic engineer and learn together about how traffic signal timing impacts the ability of an older adult to successfully navigate their community. You just have to be willing to, to put in uh, the time. Uh, so what Dr. Cog typically does is I think the most important thing to understand is that we consider this, this uh, tool to only be successful if it's locally owned. Um, that's something that I learned very early in those beta uh, testing communities that I mentioned. Uh, I walked in the door or to a couple meetings and they just were under the impression that Dr. Cog was asking them uh, to do this and there wasn't necessarily 100% local buy-in. This is a local effort that is simply supported by a tool that was developed um, at, at the regional level. I typically work most closely with communities to help them design an effective process. I help them connect to other communities that have gone through this so they can kind of have sort of brothers and sisters in arms to kind of understand what they may have gone through. And then, I, you know, we do serve as a resource to help people kind of navigate uh, the process. Uh, so there's a, a few key um, sort of messages that I make sure um, people understand early on is this is not, even though I sort of emphasize that this is about um, sort of local staff and operations, this is not about specifically about services provided by that local government. This is sort of an assessment of is that service or program or need being addressed um, in the community, right? So it could be community partners, it could be local government, it could be a local government that's, that's, that's actually not the one taking the assessment. So we've had lots of communities, uh, municipalities that have done this that really rely on the county for human services. So that's just something to understand. This is not are you providing this service or program, it's, is it available? Um, I also do a lot of coaching around this is going to identify some needs, but, but also understand during the process you probably are doing things that are really successful programs that you can build on. So think about that as well. Um, and that this assessment is not the deliverable. It's only, a, it's only a series of answers to questions. You need to be able to take it a little bit further to identify and prioritize um, what your ne next steps might be. And maybe most importantly is Dr. Cog does not evaluate or review results. I think I've had nine communities go all the way through this. I have never seen a single assessment. It's not, it's, to me, it's not our, our job or purview. Um, I want the conversation at the local level to be as open and honest as possible. And if someone thinks they're being graded or evaluated by Dr. Cog, that might not happen. So I make it a point locally owned. I don't need to see it. I'm there to help. But the assessment and the evaluation really should be your own. And we've typically also coached people that this is one of the things that they can do to make this process as effective as possible is to pair it with some quantitative results as well. So one of the things that we um, do every four or five years is that community assessment survey of older adults. And so you can actually have real quantitative data about the experiences of older adults in your communities that you can then pair with that sort of more qualitative assessment that staff is doing to sort of figure out what are the things that we really can, can work on um, going forward that feel like maybe those lower hanging fruits or most um, immediate needs. So a few early success stories, and, th and this is just kind of a few things that have come out of the folks that have gone through this. A uh, community that um, was facing a real housing shortage um, created a new accessory dwelling unit ordinance. Um, a housing authority that was involved in the conversation really realized that their portfolio was short of senior restricted units, so they made it a point to begin to add those units to their portfolio. Uh, a community um, realized that they were getting a lot of constituent calls um, and hits on the website that were really older adults looking for services and programs. And so rather than making that the third click, make it, the, make it very easily identified on the home page so that they can navigate to that as quickly um, as possible. Um, to things like activating um, senior commissions. Uh, that's one of the things that really has come out of this is they get a hold of this and they understand kind of how they can most uh, effectively understand the issues in the community and then be effective advocates um, with commissions and councils. A question for you. Sure. W what community was it that did the uh, ADU ordinance? Uh, uh, I believe uh, Lyons, I think, added an ADU ordinance um, not too long after they uh, went through this process. We'll have to talk. Sure. Other questions? Are you done? Nope. No. Nope. Oh, keep going. <laughs> I was just rudely interrupting. You were just was, jumping in. Yeah. yeah. Uh, close to done. Um, other other codes and ordinances. So um, an accessory dwelling unit is obviously an, an adjustment to, to the zoning code. We've also had communities that have either had new or revised um, codes related to visitability and universal design. Um, a lot that have focused on the relationships between law enforcement and the older adult community to create sort of dynamic um, relationships that allow law enforcement and public safety to understand the needs of that population. Folks that have recognized how important code enforcement is, that, that at 
that people are struggling financially and physically to actually keep up with uh, maintenance requirements. And so can code, can code enforcement do some things up front um, to, to take care of issues so that they don't deal with um, citations? Uh, a new community resource center to connect older adults and caregivers um, to programs and services. So just a few things that have really kind of come out locally um, uh, from this work. Um, um, some ideas of kind of how this program has been received both sort of locally and nationally. Um, I get requests all the time to come talk about this. This is something that has garnered attention uh, and interest um, nationally. Just um, back in uh, June, we co-hosted uh, a, a conversation in this room over two days with AARP and sort of peer agencies um, from around uh, the country about how people are folk, um, addressing uh, the, er the area of, of age-friendly communities. And AARP selected Dr. Cog as the host largely because of our progress on this work and, and really connecting um, local governments uh, to that conversation. What's one interesting thing that has come out of that just in the first few months after the uh, program is the, the AARP state office in California is now going to use the tool that we created in Denver and going to apply it in major metro areas in California. They're going to take it and calibrate it to the California experience and use um, our tool. So someone even outside of um, Colorado has sort of recognized um, uh, the importance of, of this work. Uh, Jennifer and I were just in San Diego to get um, an award from the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, one of their innovations award for uh, this program as well. Some other sort of current activities uh, and, and a little bit about next steps. Uh, we're currently actively working with the city and county of Denver um, on what they're calling the Age Matters uh, assessment. We actually worked collectively with the city to, to, to fundraise around this because it was going to be such a huge endeavor. They really thought having Dr. Cog along for the ride would really um, help them. Um, so we're, we're offering both strategic, tactical, and technical assistance um, along the way. Uh, we re recently received money through the Department of Local Affairs to assist some of our smaller communities. Um, this has typically worked where, again, I, I work with a local staff person. They take it and, and run with it, oftentimes with me maybe doing a little bit of coaching um, along the way. But that was going to be very difficult in a smaller community that, that, that may, only, may have zero paid staff or less than three paid staff. So this would allow Dr. Cog to actually come in and, and facilitate uh, that community um, conversation. Uh, you'll probably hear more about that um, coming up. Uh, we're also working um, on a, a report that would really um, celebrate a lot of the great things that are happening uh, locally. Um, Jennifer mentioned the idea exchange coming up at the end of the month. We'll preview um, some of the great things that are happening both in cities and counties um, that really are bleeding edge type things, not only in our region but also in the country to create uh, age-friendly communities. A few kind of lessons learned um, having spent the better part of five years um, working um, on this topic. Uh, the aging conversation as a planning topic is more personal than most, and, and the reality is, you know, it alienates some people. Um, at the local staff level, they, I will often hear, we care about everybody. We, we are planning and working to create a community that works for everyone. Why should we focus specifically just on this one cohort um, or demographic? Others are sort of the other way. They, they, maybe they're a sandwich generation person that has, that is, um, primary caregiver for children, but also dealing with an older adult, and they recognize how important community design and infrastructure is to creating a place where someone can age independently. So it, it runs um, all over the place. Um, the, the assessment can be a little overwhelming. Um, there's, I have yet to run into a single staff person at the local level that is like an aging czar that, that knows the ins and outs of everything in terms of the impact um, and local operations. Um, but we've also recognized that those small steps and incremental change um, can be really important and that really uh, what a lot of people are aiming for is simply creating that aging lens um, that people are more actively and uh, purposely thinking about older adults as they make um, decisions um, at the local level. And the, the last two bullets are kind of maybe bundled together. Um, having gone through this um, at least 11 times, every community and circumstance is different. But, but having a, a place to start that even though it was developed regionally has been really helpful uh, for folks, um, but it's not without challenges. Um, every council and commission is different. Every staff that I work with is different. The community context and circumstances um, are different. But again, having, having a resource to, be, to begin the conversation has certainly been helpful um, at the local level. So if you want to know more, call me or email me or ask questions. Director Rakowski. Three quick questions. One, is the term boomer uh, bond, bonds copyrighted? Two, are your slides and uh, tools copyrighted? And three, have you considered it as a source of revenue? 
Uh, so, copy, so copyrights and trademarks in the first two, no. Um, revenue, um, in, in some ways, in Denver is the first place that has paid us to help them. Uh, we, 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 we have largely done this uh, as a as sort of a community service, and I mean, in some ways, for us to give Denver the amount of help that it seemed like that they were going to need based on our conversations, there was no way for us to actually support them otherwise. So that's really where that joint fundraising came in. We identified we're going to have to give you X amount of hours of support to do this as your fundraising to support this from the philanthropic community. You know, look, think about how Dr. Cog. Uh, can help with this, and in some ways, that's where the the Dola funds came in as well. Like for us to 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 financially be able to provide the level of support needed in some of our smaller communities, we're simply we're going to have to have revenue associated to do that. Yeah, I I I was asked the question by the the, the California person, can we use it? And the reason I I just went ahead and said yes is that we developed this tool uh, based on volunteers with no effort, no no end goal in mind to actually turn it into a revenue producing tool and I, I, I would have approached that group differently if I would have thought on, on, the, on the back end that Dr. Cog was going to use the time that they volunteered to ultimately generate revenue. It was one of the reasons why I was like just go ahead and do it and it's going to take significant work on their part to locally calibrate. They're, they're just simply using this as a, as a starting point. Um, this is not turnkey uh, for them. It'll give them, get them, let's call it 60% of the way, but they're going to have to do quite a bit of work at the local level to make it a tool and a resource that works for their uh, communities and circumstances. Yeah. Jennifer. You know, I, I think you know, one of the reasons it didn't necessarily occur to us to make it revenue generating for AARP um, yeah. No, no, what I meant uh, for, for Dr. Cog is because AARP National actually gave us a little bit of seed money to kind of get this thing Correct. up and going. Um, but we are, as, as you all know, we talked about um, uh, fee-for-service and uh, diversifying our revenue sources and um, uh, all of that sort of thing about this time actually last year. And certainly this is just one more of those things that we will continue to look at. Great idea. <laughs> Other questions or comments? Director Cernanic. Uh Yes, real quick, um, wonderful uh, summary uh, there. Two items that um, have been helped by local communities. One is, uh, I know one has gone to an online tool as opposed to a paper-based tool, uh, which was something that at least one of the jurisdictions took on. So it's been done cooperatively uh, on that front. Uh, second piece is you talked about uh, resources being used. Um, Medicare is not typically the, the one that's a, that's a big impact. It's the Medicaid side uh, that we're already seeing some strains here in the Colorado budget uh, over that. Um, and it's only going to get uh, worse unless folks are supported in being able to live independently, even in, and some support is often required uh, by those that are uh, over 75. And even if it's just um, trying to deal with the safety of uh, pre-autonomous vehicles and older age drivers um, being in that category I'm you know I'm, it's one of those things that uh, it's it's always a good thing but uh, it's the it's the Medicaid or the transportation side that's that's often the, the big item that that gets impacted good points other comments all right thanks Brad great presentation so we're going to move on to committee reports, and I'll start um, by giving an update on the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Um, we got briefed on the bike and ped program. Um, Stack's in the process of um, updating the statewide bike and ped plan and also putting together a statewide map that locals can add their information to. Um, as folks know, the governor has two initiatives related to this. One is the Colorado Pedals Project, and the other is the Colorado Beautiful Initiative. Both involve biking and trails. Um, another focus was that the FAST Act is requiring, in relatively short order, for um, everyone to designate alternative fuel corridors. In fact, they, the feds gave us three whole weeks to do it. 
So uh, a working group was formed. I was on it and Doug and some others from Weld County um, to try to put together uh, a draft corridor plan for the state. And that's, it's not clear how it will be used because there's no funding associated with it, but it's, it's an opportunity potentially to draw future funding towards um, different alt fuel facilities on these corridors. Um, Stack's also working on uh, identifying its national multimodal freight network components in Colorado. And then um, we also got a briefing by CDOT on the status of Bustang, which is going really well. They're looking to expand the routes and how they wanted to spend their Senate Bill 228 funds for that purpose. And finally, there's going to be a stack retreat on September 23rd. It's going to be lots of fun. And uh, we're going to meet, I think, with at least some of the Transportation Commission members to talk about um, how to work together even better in the future. You may recall that there was state legislation passed that, that now clarifies that stack reports gives recommendations to both um, the Transportation Commission and CDOT staff. So. That's the stack update, and next up is Director Atchison on Metro Mayors. We don't meet till next month. No meeting there. Um, I'll report on the Metro Area County Commissioners. We don't meet all summer, but we will be meeting September 23rd. Denver's hosting what should be an exciting conversation around affordable housing. Phil, do you want to, Director Shenanik, do you want to talk about the AAA? Yes. Uh, did not have a meeting in July. We do have a meeting coming up this Friday, uh, but I, I did want to mention, uh, as uh, you have, uh, Director Jones, uh, there was a mini workshop at the board workshop, a uh, couple of items that uh, may tease folks to at least take a look. Uh, one is uh, the idea, the many of the attendees were amazed at the comprehensive degree of services provided through the Area Agency on Aging. Uh, second, as you saw in the chart, 65% um, growth in the 75 to 79 year olds. Um, that's uh, running even faster than the than the boomer uh, growth uh, because that's folks that are pre-boomers uh, or at least born before the boomers uh, that are there. At the um, June meeting as well, there was a presentation on liver diseases and for those that might be in the boomer category that are in this room, um, it was surprising to the uh, advisory committee the prevalence of hepatitis C among boomers. And uh, it doesn't particularly have great symptoms that you notice, but make sure that you're getting a blood test at your physical. Before that, make sure you're getting a physical. Uh, and uh, so there's a, there's a sequence to that. Um, but what happens is the complications when other diseases come about, uh, whether it's type 2 di diabetes that uh, often emerges as well as others, uh, the complications that come with uh, the, the hep C is there. Um, and we're looking at some things that come out of our uh, May workshop that uh, the ACA had uh, regarding a legislative subcommittee and reconfiguring the, uh, the ACA itself. And I uh, did want to give a shout out to reports that came from Adams County uh, with regard to the aging network, uh, with regard to mission goals and objectives uh, that occur. So Eva, uh, kudos on that. And I just happened to be sitting next to Director Truhar. Uh, and if folks didn't see it in the newspaper this morning, the only regional newspaper that we kind of have, the Denver Post. Um, <laughs> Centennial gets a gets a shout out a shout out for what they're doing with regard lift and and transportation to uh, the light rail station, but they're also looking at the uh, mobility ambassador program and what they're doing with Uber and Lyft uh, across uh, Centennial, which is a uh, how would you describe the shape of Centennial? You know, a, a barbell that uh, kind of goes uh, not quite the length, but about half the length of Arapahoe County, because uh, uh, I think that's what Commissioner Holland said, something like that. Uh, so those are all things that are that are happening. And um, when Brad talks about uh, folks and taking on the conversation around seniors, 
Uh, it's kind of like the emotional response that we get when we start talking about climate change. Uh, you know, everyone may raise a flag about it. Uh, there may be some arguments about what the causes might be uh, in that, but it's as uh, municipal and county officials, it is incumbent upon us to do the, the planning for our committee, uh, communities uh, and, to, and to take that on. And um, one of the things that uh, I know many of you I have the opportunity to travel to Washington or have an opportunity to talk to the folks that uh, are our U.S. representatives and our U.S. senators. Um, there will be uh, very soon uh, the be <laughs> what should be the beginning of looking at what's the next step on the Older Americans Act. And it's important to get an equitable formula. And Colorado at the moment is, um, excuse my French, uh, is being screwed uh, with the allocation that occurs because the uh, states that do not have the same kind of growth in our senior programs are, are saying, hey, we're not going to get any less than we've got before. Uh, so it's a limited pot. Uh, we have a much higher growth rate in our senior population uh, that has needs. And uh, as we send money to Washington and it comes back at a discount, we would at least like to have an equitable dis, uh, distribution of those discounted dollars after Washington takes their share. Thank you. Thank you. Director Shakti, do you want to talk about the rec? What's that? We didn't meet. I believe we didn't meet. Didn't Nothing meet. new to report since last, yes. Okay. Director Rakowski. Uh, construction widening to three lanes each direction from Parker to Quincy continues. All right, and Bill Van Meter is not here, so we'll have to wait on any further update on Fast Tracks. Which brings me to the end of our agenda. Are there any matters from board members? Director Shakti. Uh, does this work? It's, it's not working well. <laughs> the green light on? Yeah. Does this better? Yeah. Um, so as part of MAP 21, um, it has the agency making performance and outcome-based systems for awarding federal transportation dollars. And they're making, they're doing the rule process right now. And um, their proposed rules, um, and I'm quoting from an email I got from the National League of Cities, um, completely misses the mark by measuring single occupancy vehicle speed seven different ways without expressing the extent to which alternative forms of transportation such as transit, walking, or biking alleviate congestion on our roads. Um, what's more, it punishes cities that place value on slowing traffic through main street corridors. Um, so I, I, I interacted with Doug and I think that there's going to be, Dr. Cog is going to work on comments. But um, the National League of Cities is submitting comments um, in, in the next maybe two days. And so tomorrow I will email the link to that sign-on letter to everyone in case you might want to sign it. I would just add, thanks for bringing that up. I think it is an important issue. Boulder County submitted its own comments, but um, I'm glad to hear that Dr. Cog staff are working on some, and I encourage folks to take a look at that. Any other matters? Director Pfeiffer. I just want to compliment again the retreat. I enjoyed it. Uh, oh, sorry, I get to, I feel like the president, but uh, you yeah. get, oh, there. <laughs> I'm not sitting up here anymore. I'm gonna go over there. <laughs> but I just want to compliment the staff and, and the p and &E group putting that together. Great job. Um, um, and, and I think the content of the, the retreat out of the three or four I've been to has, was a lot it really resonated and it really connected for us that were up there and in fact Brad you did a great job tonight but something that Brad did tonight I see that as being our workshops so they're more informational and more interactive and not necessarily at a business meeting so I think as we continuously improve how we operate as a board I would throw that out as some content to give to to, to staff to maybe streamline our our meetings a little bit more because what we learned up there I think it would be beneficial for those that couldn't make it 
here at a workshop because they were great, they were interactive and good information. And I also learned that I have more than a, one boss, my wife. I think Bob said he was my boss. And did Ashley say she's my boss? John tries to be, so apparently I work for a lot of people in this room. <laughs> do you and get don't paid, you do forget you get paid, it. Do you get paid for all of us? I get 60 bucks. <laughs> it truly was a great retreat, so we can't thank staff enough and the, the committee members who planned it. It was really good. All right, any final comments? I would note that it is 9 till 8, and I am adjourning the meeting. <laughs>